All right. Thank you. Thanks for the very kind intro. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about light transport analysis. And if you don't know anything about computational imaging, and it sounds like many of you don't, um, well, don't worry. This is going to be a very gentle introduction to some topics in this space. So I want to start off by just giving you a really general idea of, well, how I define computational imaging and computational displays, which are basically two sides of the same coin. So computational imaging involves thinking about how can we change the, not just the software of imaging devices, but changing the hardware as well. So this might be like thinking about how we can design the optics of a camera or the sensors of a camera in a different way, in addition to uh, combining it with new types of algorithms to produce images that you wouldn't be able to capture with a traditional camera. So examples of computational imaging applications include things like HDR imaging, which refers to high dynamic range photography. HDR is actually something that you find on most smartphones today. So a smartphone device is able to capture uh, these high dynamic range images refers to uh, basically capturing detail in very bright areas and dark areas within a scene simultaneously. Uh, we can also perform super resolution imaging, which is trying to get higher resolution images out of low resolution sensors. And light field imaging, which is a imaging task that allows us to, uh, or a data structure that allows us to digitally refocus images after they've been already captured. And a lot of these ideas also extend towards displays as well. So uh, the idea of changing the hardware and software of devices can be used to extend the capabilities of display technologies in order to produce high dynamic range displays, meaning displays that can produce more vivid imagery, uh, super resolution displays, and even light field displays, which are 3D displays that you can, uh, can appreciate without the need for wearing special glasses like those that you wear in a theater. But today, I'm going to talk about basically the intersection of these two areas. So I'm going to talk about techniques that make use of controlling the light using computational displays and computational cameras to capture light that comes back in response. And specifically, light transport analysis is this idea of using light patterns that we can send out into a scene and sensors to measure the light that comes back in response to analyze properties about our physical world. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what that means in just a little bit. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how does light actually interact with the world? So uh, here's a photo that I've captured uh, a few years ago where there's a lot of things going on in this photo, right? So we have a bunch of glasses with liquids in them. Uh, and these liquids are dyed in uh, a bunch of different colors. And we have some light that's casting shadows across the scene. And in order to produce a photo like this one, light has to interact with the scene in many different complex ways. So for example, in the back here, we have light that's scattering off of surfaces, right? At this point, some light at certain colors or wavelengths will be absorbed and some lights will be scattered. And this produces the appearance that we see at this corner of the scene. Excuse me. We also have these, uh, these uh, glasses filled with liquid that absorb light at certain wavelengths or colors as well. So for example, we might have uh, uh, well, these, this red glass due to light being absorbed at certain wavelengths. And we might also have some scattering uh, that's going on uh, when light passes through this liquid. If we're to look at the back here, we also have this uh, light that's refracting through glass. So if we have, uh, for example, water filled up, uh, filling up the glass, light that passes through the glass will be refracted. It'll bend as soon as it intersects that, uh, that surface. And so as a result, what we see is something that looks a little bit like this uh, lensing effect here at the back. Uh, let me just turn on my laser pointer. There we go. This lensing effect where we have the color pink on the left side of the glass and color green on the right side of the glass, basically transmitting light from the left, uh, the background uh, in this photo. 
We also have reflections. Instead of refractions, like reflecting off the surfaces, hopefully that's self-explanatory. We also have mutual interreflections. So uh, light from one surface can transfer color to another surface from light that's bouncing between these surfaces. And we also have shadows and caustics. Uh, caustics are formed by light basically focused to certain regions. And all of these different types of transport effects exist in every real world scene. So it might not be immediately apparent to us, but effectively light interacts with scenes in very complex ways. And so this makes it hard to render images like this. So from a computer graphics perspective, where we're interested in producing photorealistic images, it might be hard to capture all of these effects. And so we have to have special algorithms to render these things out in an efficient way. From a light transport analysis point of view, these types of effects are interesting because each of them can tell us something a little bit, uh, 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 tell us a little bit about the scene. We can start pulling out properties about our scene. For example, what type of liquid is contained in this glass or what's the shape of some of these objects based off of how light reflects or refracts off of these things. And so that's the subject for today. We're gonna to talk about light transport analysis, which I also refer to as computational light transport, which involves trying to take advantage of lights that you can control and cameras that you also control to sample, acquire, and then analyze the way light interacts with the scene, or what we call as the scene's transport function, a function that basically takes in as input the lighting parameters, so how bright your light source is, where it's coming from, where it's, what's its color, and then outputs basically what an image would look like in response to a particular set of lighting conditions. Any questions so far? Does that sound good? And by the way, if you have a question, want to jump in, feel free to uh, just uh, interrupt me at any point in this talk. All right. So one example of where this can be handy is in 3D sensing. So a lot of 3D sensors actually make use of lighting that's used to illuminate the environment and then special sensors to measure light that comes back in response. So for example, a LiDAR, which is a light, detecting, uh, light detection and ranging system, is a device that you'd find on top of self-driving cars, for example, that's used to basically compute a 3D model of your surrounding environment. So this video shows basically a point cloud, uh, basically a 3D distribution of points that represents the environment that's surrounding a car that's driving on the road here. And each one of these points was actually measured by this device through sending light out into the scene. And in this case, using uh, the time it takes for light to come back to the sensor to measure distance. So this is an example of a, a device that's using the time of travel of light to measure 3D shape. We also have 3D sensors in our smartphones. So for example, the iPhone X and future generations have these depth sensors that can be used to scan your face. And what they're actually doing are sending these, uh, these dot patterns out onto someone's face. We don't see it with our naked eye because this is uh, sending out infrared light. So we don't see infrared light, but if you did, if you were able to, you would see basically a dot pattern projected onto your face. And these cameras capture images in response and use this information to figure out the 3D shape of your face, perhaps to unlock your device or do something cute like fit an emoji to your, to your face. There are also more complex devices like the one I'm showing here. This is actually a, a somewhat old now, but this is a, something called a light stage. This is a device or a system rather that's used in the visual effects industry to capture an actor under different lighting conditions. So we learn the light transport of an actor and we can use this information to actually take that actor and place them into a virtual environment in a photorealistic way. So I'll show you an example of this here. So this is a, a, a snapshot of an actor that was captured within that dome and then was placed into this virtual environment um, where we get all the lighting 
conditions correct because we measured them directly with this dome of cameras and lights. In fact, miniature versions of these, oh, well, actually, let me just uh, play this video. I didn't realize it was a video here. So this first sequence shows this capture process. So we have an actor that's walking around within a stage, uh, walking on the, this treadmill, and it's, he's surrounded by a bunch of cameras and light sources. Now, it might look like it's not doing very much, but if you see this in high speed, well, you can see all these lights flickering about and turning on one group at a time and capturing this person under these different lighting conditions. This can then be used to basically synthesize views of the actor uh, that are illuminated under these different conditions. And we can use all of this information and then take that actor and then place them into a virtual environment in a, in a photorealistic way. All right. Let me see if I can just skip here. To the end. So here we have our actor that's walking around and he's meeting his twin. And this is all computer generated, obviously, in this case. So we took this actor, captured it from different perspectives under different lighting conditions, and we can get the lighting just right. And we can therefore just duplicate, co uh, copy this actor multiple times and uh, paste them all over the scene, which is kind of cool. So this is an old example, but this is a, uh, a technology that's actually used in a lot of uh, um, films today. Uh, it's also been miniaturized. So we had a mini version of this that was actually uh, created by the uh, by Paul de Bavac and colleagues at USC. And they, they built this device, brought it over to the White House, and used it to actually scan the 3D shape uh, of a person's face, in this case, Barack Obama, to create a presidential 3D printed bust of the president in this case. So again, this is very similar to before. We have a bunch of cameras and we have a bunch of light sources, each one basically illuminating the scene one source at a time, capturing a bunch of photos in response. And then we can use this information to pull out a very, very photorealistic uh, and accurate representation of uh, the president's face in this case. We also use a lot of these techniques uh, in microscopy. So here's an example of an aperture correlation microscope. Uh, it's also sometimes or is related to something known as a confocal microscope that allows you to actually see through tissue more clearly. Uh, so in this case, I'm not going to go over the entire optical design here, uh, but uh, what it's producing are images like the one shown here in uh, uh, labeled B. So this is an image of a volumetric sample where if you're to use a normal microscope to image this sample, you would get something like this on the right-hand side, which is blurry because it's actually layered. It has some 3D shape. There's some parts of the sample that are including other parts. And so that might make it harder to analyze by using basically a, a sophisticated optical setup that takes advantage of controllable lights and cameras. Uh, we can actually pr produce a, a very clean version, basically a section version, as if we took that sample and we extracted a particular layer from that sample and imaged that directly. It allows us to see much uh, finer structures here uh, in a, a lot cleaner way. We get rid of uh, the occluding areas from layers uh, before and after the layer that we're interested in imaging. So with that, that's the general overview of some of the different types of topics that you might relate to or think about when we talk about light transport analysis. Each one of those is making use of some type of light source, some type of camera, and computation in the mix to actually do some interesting tasks. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about basically this light transport model. Uh, and uh, this is a general model for describing the transfer of radiant energy. And we'll use this and we'll, uh, for a couple of different tasks. So we'll talk about some examples of these transport matrices for real scenes, the challenges associated with working with these matrices. And I'll introduce, if we have enough time, uh, some algorithms that we can use to analyze these matrices. All right. Any questions?
And I can't see the chat, so you're going to have to speak up if you do have questions. All right. Okay, so how do we actually model a light transport? So let's start simple. We're going to start with just one light source and one sensor, right? So we might have an LED on the left-hand side here, and then we might have a, a single pixel that's measuring the light that comes out from a scene. And we have some function that describes the transport of light from the source to the sensor, right? And we can maybe add some units to this. So maybe the light source ends up sending out some energy in terms of joules. Uh, and uh, the sensor receives some amount of energy measured in joules in response. Now, it seems like, well, this function can be very complex, but there's some interesting and simple properties that we can observe using just a, a simple configuration like this one. The first is that the light that comes out of a scene is always non-negative, right? So we can't detect negative energy. The energy that we see is always positive or non-negative at least. Um, so that's one important property is the fact that this function T that describes basically what light's coming out of a scene must always produce non-negative results. Another implication of this is that the light sources also have to produce non-negative light, right? You can't send out negative energy out of the scene. A second property is the fact that uh, this function also satisfies typically this, this simple uh, property that if we're to scale the light source by some factor, for example, if I multiply the intensity of the source by two, I create twice as much light that goes into the scene, I'll typically get twice as much light coming back to my sensor. Right? So this is a nice simple relationship that already allows us to do some interesting things. So for example, if I have a photo of my scene, as shown over here, I can synthesize what the scene would look like under different illumination conditions. Specifically, I can synthesize a scene where I scale the brightness of my light source by a factor of two. And I can synthesize this simply by taking the pixels of my photo and then just multiplying them all by a factor of two right, to produce this synthetic photo on the right-hand side. And so the synthetic photo now is capturing basically what the scene would have looked like if we had a slightly brighter light source. We can do the opposite as well. So I could potentially decrease the energy of my light source. Now, in this case, I'm going to multiply this image by a factor of 0 0.5. So everything's a little bit dimmer. One has to be a little bit careful, though. So this photo, the synthetic photo, might look right except that in certain areas of the photo, uh, it's actually computing something that's not quite correct because the photo that we've captured was saturated in these regions. And because of these saturated regions, we don't actually know how bright these regions of the photo actually were in the scene. And so uh, this will produce a slightly incorrect result over here. So we have to be a little bit careful sometimes. But if we're to ignore saturation or if we didn't have saturation in our photo, this would produce a, a perfect representation of what the scene would look like if we had to decrease the light source by a factor of 0 0.5. Now, I'll just mention very briefly here that this doesn't always hold true. So for example, there are scenarios where light behaves in somewhat more complicated ways. Um, so here we actually have uh, a microscope objective at the top here that's focusing light through some sample. And on the left is what we would typically expect to see, where we have this cone of light that shows light being focused to a particular region. This is where the sample would be placed, right? You would be imaging something at this particular location. And, uh, and this is showing basically light that's scattering in different parts within this volume. On the right-hand side, however, what we have is something that's, that's slightly different that's going on. Actually, the, the light that's being pumped in is infrared light. So we don't actually see it with a normal camera. But we do see this green dot that's appearing. And this is due to a, a, some complex procedure. It's a nonlinear optical procedure that takes basically two photons of light, right, the quanta of light, and combines them together to produce light of a different wavelength. 
in this case, green. And so at this particular region, there's this nonlinear effect going on that complicates the transport function. But these are, uh, while you can exploit this in order to produce really complex and interesting microscopes that's able to see deeper to tissue and produce clearer images, uh, we're going to ignore it for the sake of this presentation. So there are scenarios where this function t is no longer behaving in this nice linear way, uh, but we're going to just ignore those situations for the time being. So now let's try to complicate the model a little bit more. So instead of just one light source, let's add a second light source and see what happens to the function when we're working with these two light sources. So one of the key observations here is that when we're measuring light from a scene, measurements under two light sources, so for it to take two images, one under one light source, one on the other light source, uh, and we're to sum these two together, they'll equal to an image of the scene with both light sources turned on at the same time. And here's an example. So here I have my, my scene like before, where I have two light bulbs, now that are turned on. And this photo is a real photo of the scene. So I turned these two on, captured a photo. I also captured two photos, one with only one light source on, one with only the other light source on. And if I were to add these two together, well, the synthetic photo on the left-hand side is equal to the real photo, right? They, they look identical, right? So this is an example of taking advantage of this property. Even though I might not have captured this directly, I can synthesize it by just taking two photos of the scene under one light source and another, and then just add those two photos together uh, in order to synthesize uh, images like this one. And just to show that this is a really good, accurate representation of the real scene, well, if I were to take the difference between the real photo and the synthetic one, I get a very dark image. It's a slightly brighter in these regions just because there's more noise in areas that contain more light. But otherwise, it's a pretty good representation of the, uh, the scene. So once we have this kind of this, uh, these two photos, we can actually do a little bit more. So instead of just summing these two photos together, we can use a previous property to control how much light uh, we're seeing from both photos. So we can make one. Uh, uh, one light source brighter than the other, right? We can double the intensity, we can have the intensity and so on. Uh, or I can, uh, for example, just zero out one of the light sources completely. Um, and so basically once I have these two photos, I can create basically images or video sequences where I'm arbitrarily controlling the intensity of these lights the way I would like to, like to configure the scene. So I can make my light sources brighter, dimmer and, and so on. I can also change the color of my light sources. So I could grab the red color channel of the first image, the blue color channel of the second image, summed up, uh, sum them up together to produce an image as though the light bulb on the left was red and the light bulb on the blue was, uh, on the right is blue. Now, there's nothing preventing us here from just uh, extending this even further. So uh, before we do that, of what we'll do is uh, we'll just provide some slight mathematical rigor here to explain what's going on, right? So this is uh, basically a, well, a nice, simple uh, linear system. We have a couple of images. We can weigh them differently. We can add things together. And so as a result, we can produce or generate a, a, a linear system to represent these images that are coming out in response. So in this case, I'm going to take each of these photos and I'm going to vectorize them. I'm going to represent them with vectors, p in this case, for example, or ti, to express the pixel values within these corresponding images. Right? So these vectors are of length n, where n is the number of pixels in your photos. And in the case where we have these two light sources that we're going to uh, turn on and off and uh, change their intensity, well, I'm going to express the intensity of these light sources with a weight L sub i. This weight basically controls how bright my light source is. If L sub i is zero, then I'm basically going to just zero out the contribution of one photo. If it's one, then I'm just going to add the contribution of the, the light. I can change it to whatever value I want as before. 
And so I have L sub I multiplied with my images to produce basically the photos, the synthetic photos that I'm trying to generate. So just to be clear again, uh, the length of these vectors of, are of length n, because we have n pixels in our images, we'll have n elements within these vectors. We have these vectors T sub i representing our different light sources. Uh, we also have these weights that control the contribution of this particular photo to our final image. And we can also uh, have as many light sources as we want in this case. So in this case, we only have two. So we might just sum up only two images with two weights associated with them. But we can also generalize this to any number of light sources. So there's nothing preventing us from just repeating this procedure for as many light sources as we have available. So we can rewrite this as a linear system. We can rewrite this as a matrix vector product. So we can have a matrix T, which is going to be of size n by m, where n is the number of pixels in our photo, and m is the number of light sources in our scene. And we can multiply this matrix with a vector L, which contains the weights that we use to determine the contribution of every light source within our scene. And the product of T and L will produce the, the photos P that uh, we're interested in capturing or synthesizing. Any questions so far? All right, I assume no. And uh, so let's talk about different types of properties now that we can potentially work with. So sometimes we might not just be interested in changing what light source is turned on, but maybe we're interested in changing the color of the light. So for example, we might have a light source that's emitting one particular wavelength, and a sensor that measuring some wavelength in response. And we can build up these matrices that will describe this transfer of color as well. Uh, so this is uh, a snippet from a paper that was published uh, around 11 years ago that was measuring the light transport matrix that describes the transfer of color from one wavelength to another. So typically when you send out, say, light of a particular wavelength or color, you'll get the same color back. But sometimes uh, material properties of objects might actually fluoresce, meaning it will absorb light at one wavelength and emit light at a different wavelength. And so uh, we can capture matrices or produce matrices that will describe that transfer of color. And we can use it in a very similar way that we're uh, gener uh, that, uh, uh, well, we can use it in a very similar way to how we're using it before, where we can combine different images together uh, to synthesize images under different lighting conditions. In this case, we can synthesize, if we have one of these matrices, synthesize what the scene would look like under different colors of light. We can also control the polarization state of light. Now, if this is a topic that you're not familiar with, I'm not going to go into this too much detail, but uh, polarization is a useful cue uh, that's related to uh, the direction of, uh, or how light is propagating. Uh, so polarization is something that we can't see with our naked eyes, but we can design sensors to capture this type of information. And I'm not going to dig into what polarization is because this can be a, kind of a complicated topic, but it can be used to measure the stress of different materials. So for example, these, these images are captured by using polarization to measure basically the uh, uh, changes in uh, the stress of these different materials. Um, so this can be useful uh, cue for basically doing quality assurance, making sure that parts are being fabricated in a in a in a in a reliable way, right? That they're uh, that you don't have any stress points, areas where uh, these objects might be very fragile. Um, so these images are just showing basically the result of some polarization techniques that I'm not going to go into. We can also use time to advantage here. So at the very beginning, I was mentioning this concept of a LIDAR, light detection and raging system, which measures the time it takes for light to travel through an environment. And so we can do that by using light sources that flash light at one instant in time and very fast sensors that can measure the light in response at a second instant in time. 
And so we can use this as a way to create videos like this one. So this is a video that was created in uh, at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, and this is uh, by Andres Felton and Ramesh Raskar. And it's showing a pulse of light that's traveling through a Coke bottle. So we have a flash of light and special sensors that can measure what the scene would look like at a different instant in time. And so we can use these video sequences, for example, to synthesize what a normal image would look like. So a normal image, uh, an image that we would see with our naked eye, would be the results of just taking all these frames and summing them all together. But these videos by themselves actually contain a lot of interesting information about how light interacts with the scene and we can potentially pull out material properties and information about the 3D shape of these objects or what type of liquid the light's uh, passing through uh, when we're analyzing these types of, uh, this type of information. And more generally, these transport matrices can represent what the scene would look like under different lighting conditions. Uh, so we don't have to just use uh, point sources or light bulbs. We can actually take a look at what the scene would look like under different types of projector illumination. So if we have a bunch of projector uh, projectors that are illuminating the scene with patterns, and we have a bunch of cameras that are measuring the scene in response, well, we can measure or capture transport matrices that will describe how light tra travels from every projector pixel to every camera pixel. So why don't we take a look at some of these transport matrices in practice and, and see what they actually look like. All right, so what we're gonna use is a projector and camera to measure the transport matrix for a particular scene. And the reason we're using a projector here is because we can easily turn on and off projector pixels. And so this is our controllable light source. And we'll capture images of the scene under different projector illumination patterns. So we're going to start off with a object, which is just a cylindrical object. It's opaque. And we're going to measure basically light along an epipolar line. I, I don't know if this is a concept that you're already familiar with. If you're not, you can ignore it. Um, but the point is here, we're going to use a projector to illuminate points on the object. And we're going to have a camera that measures the light that comes back in response. And so we're just going to, in this case, just capture light along this particular line to see how much light is actually being transmitted from the projector to these set of camera pixels. So in this case, I'm going to take this image, pull out this particular row from the image, and store it in a matrix. So this is going to be the ith column of this matrix, where the column represents a particular light source in this case. So it represents the ice projector pixel. And every pixel on our camera is basically capturing light. And that's being stored in different elements within this column. So the cross section here represents what's actually going on at a particular camera pixel. So at element ij, we're measuring the light from projector pixel i to camera pixel j. And we can fill up this matrix by basically scanning the scene by turning on different projector pixels. So if I were to do that, I would get a matrix that looks a little bit like this. Okay. So here, different camera pixels are going to respond to different projector pixels. So if I turn on a different projector pixel, well, I'll receive light at a different camera pixel. And so we have some interesting information that's going on here. So uh, here we have this big, strong stripe here representing uh, the, the object that we're actually scanning. There's this weaker stripe in the top left corner, which represents actually light that's reflecting off in the background. Um, but we can use this information now to say something about our scene. Now, it might not look like it's all that interesting. There's not much going on here. But this information tells us which projector pixels map to which camera pixels. In other words, we know which rays from our projector and our camera correspond, uh, which rays correspond to one another. And we can use this as a way to compute 3D shape. So in fact, this matrix T can be used to produce uh, a, a disparity map. 
That is, we can measure disparity between uh, two uh, projective models, our camera model and our projector model, in order to figure out the 3D shape of our scene. So this curve is actually due to the curvature of the cylindrical object. I can measure for every projector pixel which camera pixel is receiving most of that light, figure out which rays are actually being emitted by my projector and captured by my camera, and just triangulate, intersect these two rays in 3D space to figure out the 3D point that the projector is actually illuminating. And I can repeat this process for every projector pixel and every camera pixel. So acquiring this matrix T allows us to basically produce 3D shape. So once I have this matrix T, I can just pull out the 3D shape of the scene from this information. And this is exactly what structured light 3D scanners do. Um, so it's similar to that example of the iPhone X that I was mentioning before, where it's sending out these dot patterns out into the scene. It's capturing some type of information that looks a little bit like this and using it to pull out the 3D shape of the environment. In this case, the matrix is going to be very sparse and high rank because there's only a few pixels that are going to be illuminated directly. Most of the pixels on our camera are not going to see light. There's really only one pixel for every projector pixel that, that's going to be receiving light in this particular case. So this is a particular camera projector configuration, camera lighting configuration, we can change it. And it's going to affect what is the structure of our transport matrix. So for example, instead of a projector, what if I went back to these light bulbs, right? What if I had just a bunch of point light sources that are placed at different locations within the scene? And in this case, I have the same object as before. And I'm going to illuminate it now with one of these point sources. Well, instead of illuminating just one point, on this cylindrical object, it's actually going to illuminate an area, right? Because this point source is basically radiating, radiating out light in different regions of the scene. And that light will spread across the entire object. We can measure transport matrix in the exact same way, though. We can look at the response at a particular row, store this in the column of our matrix, and this repeat this process for all light sources that we have available. So in this case, what we actually did was we took the projector and placed the diffuser in front and just repeated the same scanning pattern. But you can do the same thing by having basically a bunch of point light sources kind of aligned in a row, illuminating them one at a time and capturing a bunch of photos in response. And you'll notice that the structure is quite different here. Right? Things look quite different. Um, in fact, this information is related to the surface orientation of the object. So depending on how different points on the object are oriented relative to our light source, we're going to get a different amount of light detected by our camera. And this information can be used to pull out not 3D shape directly in this case, but the normals of the object. So this matrix is actually known to be close to rank three, or exactly rank three, rather, if there are no shadows. Um, and if you do have shadows, then it's uh, approximately rank nine. But uh, this information is actually the same type of information that's used in a technique known as photometric stereo, where in the case where we assume that there are no shadows, what we can do is we can take an object and illuminate it with three different point sources placed at different locations, capture three images in response, effectively build this matrix up, and then extract the normals from this information to figure out surface orientation. We can also use this as a way to capture 3D shape by integrating these normals uh, in order to uh, get the 3D shape of our object in that case. So uh, photometric stereo is this classic technique that was developed in the 1980s, way before all of this light transport analysis stuff was introduced. Um, but we can uh, provide a different perspective of what's actually going on when we're using techniques like that. Basically, we're capturing matrices that look like this. They have certain properties, including the fact that it's very low rank in this case, in contrast to the previous example. 
And it's basically encoding information about the surface orientation, provided that we're with convex objects that don't have interreflections uh, and that they're diffuse. We could also try replacing the object with something that's more specular. So instead of being diffuse, this object's gonna be a little bit more mirror-like. So in, in fact, in this case, we put some tinfoil on top of an object and we can repeat the same process. Illuminate it with different point sources, capture rows, stick them into columns of a matrix and build this all up. In this case, we're gonna get a very different structure once again. That is every point source, ideally if this was a perfect mirror, would only produce response at a couple of different camera pixels. And so what we have is basically a matrix, which is very, very high rank in this case. And that information can also potentially be used for recovering shape from specularities, which is yet another subject uh, that has been analyzed uh, uh, to a fair extent. So from this matrix is very different properties than before, but we can try to take advantage of the way that light speculatively reflecting off of objects to try to infer 3D shape. And so this is just showing basically the diversity of these matrices. So uh, in all cases, we just have controllable light sources, cameras that allow us to capture light in different ways, right? We're measuring how light is interacting with the scene. And depending on the configuration of our, our light sources, uh, maybe the properties of our scene, the response that we're going to get is going to be quite different, right? So in the case where we're dealing with very specular objects, then we have something that's high rank. If we're dealing with projectors, we get something that's very high rank. If we're dealing with diffuse objects and point sources, then the structure is going to be uh, very low rank in this case. So we can e complicate things even more. So, so far we've been assuming basically that light just travels straight into the scene and straight out in response. And in practice, that's not always true. So for example, if I were to replace my nice cylindrical convex opaque object with a candle, well, we'll get some, some slightly different effects. So we can repeat this procedure again, use a projector in this case to illuminate different points on the candle, capture a row, stick it into this matrix and just scan. Um, we get a, a slightly different structure. So we'll see that light in this case, actually it's kind of spread out to multiple pixels. That is, when we illuminate this one point on the object, light scatters through the surface of the candle itself, and that light is being picked up by different camera pixels. And so in this case, while the shape of the candle might be very similar to before, right, it's still the cylindrical object, um, it's the, the structure of this matrix is a little bit more complex. We're interested, if we're interested in capturing shape, we're interested in this bright curve here, but the fact that light is actually present in other areas might complicate the, the process of extracting 3D shape in cases like this. And in fact, to build 3D scanning algorithms, we have to be a little bit careful when we're dealing with translucent objects, which includes candles, as well as things like skin, which scatters a lot of light as well. So in this case, we can think of the matrix T as actually being the combination of two different matrices, one representing direct light, light that goes into the scene and comes straight out, and indirect light, that light that's basically bouncing underneath the subsurface. And the process of trying to extract the shape of a scene in this case involves trying to get the direct component out, which is the light that's reflecting just off of the surface, and then using that information to pull out shape like we were doing before. So in this case, we have a matrix which is maybe a little bit less sparse, uh, and typically still high rank. And here we have another example where we have a few different candles. Uh, again, so each of these candles have slightly different shapes. So in the candle in the middle here has uh, several ridges. The candle on the left and the right are a little bit more smooth and will have different scattering properties as a result. And so if we want to develop algorithms that are able to use lights and cameras in order to capture shape, we have to be cognizant of this. We need to know or be aware that light can behave in these ways. In fact, in general, it gets a lot more complicated. So if we have more complex scenes like this, where we have all sorts of different objects within the scene, uh, here we have, for example, candles, an open book. We have a 
a, uh, a vase, we have a mirror, uh, some blue liquid within this uh, teapot, and then a yellow bell pepper. We can scan the scene and we'll get all this complex transport effects, right? So uh, for example, at the very top over here, we have this scattering candle. At the very bottom, we have a scattering bell pepper are behaving in a very similar way. Light enters and then scatters a little bit. Um, but these other objects will interact with light in similarly complex ways. So uh, this guy over here is the open book. So light is actually reflecting off the two pages of the book, producing this type of structure here in this transport matrix. Um, over here, we have the caustics produced from light interacting with this glass vase, which is very, very complex and chaotic. We have this nice, simple structure here that's caused by a mirror in our scene, creating this X-like shape. And this, uh, uh, this blue liquid is causing these caustics, once again, that's scattering light in some interesting and some weird ways. So in general, we have to be aware that, well, you know, light can interact in, with scenes in very complex ways. And so if we want to try to measure the shape of scenes in this case, well, we have to be a little bit careful about how we're actually analyzing the images that we're capturing in response. Another property that I wanna highlight associated with transport matrices is the fact that, well, in this case, I have my projector that's illuminating the scene from a, a different position uh, from where my camera is placed. But if I were to use a beam splitter to align my projector and camera, well, the matrix in this case will actually look like this. So this is a matrix that was scanned again in the exact same way, except now we actually place the projector and the camera in a way where they're aligned with a beam splitter. So they're basically um, imaging and illuminating the scene from the same point of view. And as a result, we get this nice symmetric property of the matrix that emerges due to a property known as reciprocity, um, which I'm not gonna go into again, but this, this holds true for any scene. So if we're to align our camera and projector in this way, we'll get these nice properties uh, that we can potentially use to our benefit to try to analyze the scenes and maybe in, uh, uh, in, more easy, uh, uh, in a more easy way. So we can start to, for example, measure how much light is reflecting directly off of surfaces by just looking at the diagonal elements of this matrix and ignoring all, all the off diagonal elements, which contains most of the scattering and complex transport stuff. Now we can also replace our projector with a point source or set of point sources to capture a different type of matrix. In this case, again, this is like capturing uh, uh, the type of information that's used for extracting normal information from our scene. Um, and the scene will behave very differently in this case. So it'll be a lot more low rank. All right. Uh, so in addition to this, we need to actually analyze these transport matrices. So we have a lot of information that's available to us, but there's some challenges at actually using this information. So the first thing is that our matrix T is quite large, right? So it might depend on how large our light sources are, right? So if we're using a projector that has maybe a million pixels, then we'll have a million, million columns to this matrix T. And if we have a photo that's a million pixels as well, well, already our matrix T contains 1 trillion elements, which is gonna be way too large to actually measure directly. So these matrices are unknown, they're very general, they're extremely large. We don't really have access to random elements of this matrix. We can only measure linear combinations of their columns and their relation to the scene geometry and reflectance that actually be very complex. So in order to make use of these matrices, one way to think about it is to actually try to use algorithms that design to actually build off of the image formation model that we use to capture these matrices. So uh, here's an example. I'll just give you a quick example here to wrap things up. Um, and uh, uh, just give me a couple more minutes here. Um, so in this case, we have uh, an example of an uh, optical configuration that consists of a projector and a camera that's going to be used to illuminate an image to scene. And this image formation model is given by this expression on the left-hand side. We have a matrix T, 
which is our matrix. That's our large matrix that we can't store directly in general. We have a vector L, which describes what kind of projector patterns are going to be sent out into the scene. And we have a photo P that will measure the light that comes back in response. And so this is, this is what we're evaluating every time we illuminate the scene and capture a photo. We're basically evaluating the result of a matrix vector multiplication. So if we're interested in analyzing this matrix T, well, we can actually build algorithms around this matrix vector product. So for example, I can have maybe uh, in light transfer analysis, an algorithm that's used to analyze T that if it only depends on matrix vector products, then I can actually implement this algorithm optically without having to know the matrix T in the first place. Right? So I don't need to know T in general, provided that I only access T through these matrix vector products, because I can just replace these operations with project and capture operations. So if I'm interested in capturing the 3D shape of a scene, for example, instead of actually going through the work of illuminating the scene with all possible projector pixels and capturing a bunch of images in response, I can come up with smarter algorithms to actually extract this information from my matrix. And just to give you a very simple example, um, or not so simple example, perhaps, uh, we might be interested in computing eigenvectors of these matrices. Now, exactly why we might be interested in this it involves a, a longer discussion. But uh, an eigenvector in this case is basically just the vector that if we multiply it with the matrix, we'll get the same vector back up to some scale. In other words, in the optical sense, what this is is a projector pattern that if we're to illuminate the scene with, we'll capture that particular photo, just uh, uh, we'll capture a photo that's corresponds to the exact same illumination pattern that we sent into the scene up to some scale. And in order to capture, us, capture these eigenvectors, uh, we would typically have to measure T directly and then apply some eigenvector analysis algorithm to extract these images from that matrix. But we can also do this optically by implementing optical algorithms to analyze these matrices T. So here we have, for example, uh, uh, something known as the power iteration algorithm, which is a very simple uh, algorithm that's used to evaluate the eigenvectors of a matrix through matrix vector products. So here we have, uh, we just start off with some random vector of our choice. So we can just choose, for example, a vector of all ones or a random vector. Uh, we can illuminate the scene with that vector. In other words, we can multiply that vector with a matrix T capture a photo, normalize the photo, and then use that next photo as a way to illuminate the scene with a new set of lighting conditions. So this numerical algorithm can be turned into an optical one just by replacing this matrix vector product with a project and capture operation step. And optically, what we'd end up doing is basically doing something like the following. We'd take an image, we illuminate the scene with it. So it's just a white pattern, for example, in this case. We capture a photo, normalize that photo, and use it as our next projector pattern. And if we're to repeat this procedure over and over again, what we'll end up getting is an eigenvector of the scene, an image that we're to project it out of the scene, we get the same exact photo back. Now, this information can be used to do things like, uh, like synthesize images of the scene under different illumination conditions. So here uh, we can use multiple eigenvectors, for example, that we've captured to compute an approximation to our matrix. So if our matrix is low rank, then I can just capture a few eigenvectors, store them all up to synthesize that entire matrix in a compressive way, and then use it as a way to basically figure out what the scene would look like under novel illumination conditions. So let me just play this video back again, sorry. So here we have a light source on top of the scene that's illuminating the scene from different perspectives and producing all these shadows. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Just give me a second. Hmm. 
There we go. So we can use this approximation to our matrix by capturing a bunch of eigenvectors through this optical algorithm to synthesize what the scene would look like under novel conditions. We have a light source on top of the scene in this case, casting shadows on the scene. And these shadows are moving around depending on what type of illumination pattern that we, we produce on the right-hand side. I'll play that one more time. So here, this is illumination that's using, being used to cast light from the top down onto the scene. And these are synthetic images, images that we synthesize after basically uh, capturing our transform matrix. So with that, I, it seems like I'm a little bit uh, over time now. I just want to recap with just a couple of highlighting remarks. Uh, so this is really just an introduction to the space, but hopefully you have a sense as to, well, the power of using lights and cameras for analyzing scenes. And in fact, the models that we use to, to do this are actually exceedingly simple. It involves these matrices that uh, can be used to describe different linear combinations of photos uh, un captured under different lighting conditions to synthesize new photos under completely novel illumination patterns. And so these matrices describe the transfer of radiant energy and uh, can be used to pull out things like the 3D shape of a scene or synthesize the scene under different lighting conditions. Now, in practice, one thing to note is that these transform matrices are typically very, very large and you can't measure them directly. And so the challenge in light transport analysis is coming up with efficient algorithms to an actually analyze these things. So developing numerical algorithms that can be implemented optically effectively is one way to think about how we can actually perform light transport analysis. To take these matrices that contain this rich structure and information about our scenes, and extract properties that we can use for higher level applications like 3D shape to unlock our phones or to navigate a, a car through an environment. And with that, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about light transfer analysis, I'll just leave my links to uh, my websites over here. Uh, and I have a bunch of different projects that, that look at this uh, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and with that, I'll just end my talk here. And thanks for attending. And I'm happy to take on any questions. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Matt, for for yeah accepting our invitation and for the and for the talk. It was as great as we expected to be. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so I I always looked at at all this work related with light transport analysis with lots of interest, but always trying to to make some sense for, for the more rendering part of the things, for more of the capturing appearance, etc. And I guess the optimal color and all the would be direct could be directly applied in a Gonio reflectometer or in any uh, or in the light stage of the Bebek or all that kind of stuff, right? It's something that that I haven't seen, but but I mean after 10 years of your work or <laughs> It, 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 it seems that that's weird that being much more optimal that the kernel Nistrom and all these other methods that are that exist or there haven't been used so far. So do you have any comment on, on, on why or it's just simply because laziness? <laughs> uh, can you rephrase your question? Sorry. So um, I wonder whether these optical Arnoldi and related methods could be applied to gonio reflectometers or light stage or capture yeah. DTFs or other kind of uh, uh, data-driven appearance models. How this could be applied? Yeah. So um, there's a, a couple of different ways to kind of view it. So the I, I think of everything that we do with you know, Ghani reflectometers and light stages as basically different types of, uh, that fit within this framework, right? They're using algorithms that may not be all that sophisticated, um, but uh, you can think of them as optical algorithms as well. Uh, I think the, the, the power of 
uh, well, thinking about them as uh, as optical algorithms is that we can think about uh, how we can approach some of these problems in new ways. But it's also very challenging to do that. So, uh, for example, um, the last algorithm that I was mentioning where you're doing things in an iterative fashion uh, are useful for very specific applications, but it's been hard to kind of generalize that to other applications. Mm -hmm. um, but rather than focusing on that one particular algorithm, I, you know, I, I think about all the different kind of uh, optical systems that we've been using over the years as basically uh, fitting within this framework. We have a way to, uh, we have a light and camera kind of configuration. If we want to measure reflectance of objects, then we'll configure our lights and cameras in a specific way so that our transport matrix has a, a specific structure. Um, if I want to understand what is the possible information that I can extract from the scene, I would think about first the light transport matrix and everything that's contained with it before mm -hmm. I think about the type of algorithms that I want to use to actually pull out that information in an efficient way. So as an example, light stage is perhaps uh, the easiest example to talk about. You have this giant dome of lights uh, where you could potentially just capture the scene under individual uh, lights one at a time, but that would be very slow. So typically you would turn on patches of lights uh, in order to capture the lighting from an actor. And the patches are designed in such a way uh, that exploits some properties about our matrix. So in that case, the, the matrix is actually very low rank. And so you can use these low frequency illumination basis patterns in order to actually uh, uh, capture the matrix in a more efficient way. Um, and so I think it's helpful to think about it from this kind of holistic point of view where you have, uh, you know, uh, you structure your light sources to produce particular shapes in our matrix. And we talk about or think about types of properties within these matrices that we want, want to extract, and then what type of algorithms that we would need to use to extract this type of information. Um, and sometimes we don't discuss light transport analysis in these ways, but it's, it's a useful perspective for, or I think it's a useful perspective for kind of approaching these types of problems. Okay, Does that answer yeah. your question? <laughs> that was a little bit long-winded, but... Say in? That was a little bit long-winded, but I hope fully answered. Yeah, yeah it's easy. It actually does, and actually it related very well with this Im image I had in my mind of, of this light stage using spherical harmonics illumination, right? Similar, this kind of basis, as you have said, you pose your matrix structure depending on your problem. Yeah, okay. exactly. So, I mean, if we know the structure of our matrix, we can optimize those lighting patterns, right? Uh, and in this case, it's very low rank because often we're measuring things that are very diffuse. Uh, so that's going back to one of the slides I was mentioning before, where we have point sources, diffuse objects, we'll get these low-rank matrices. And so you would want to choose um, uh, lighting patterns, or basically uh, 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 that are uh, used to capture that low-frequency component. Um, mm -hmm. It would be very inefficient to capture things one light source at a time, so we'd want to use just a few low-frequency basis patterns in that particular case. And that comes from the structure of these matrices. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was quite interesting. Um, I got many uh, structures. So I have one question, like, because I think that it was key to, to say basically, okay, this is linear. And I can use the linear algebra machinery there. Mm -hmm. But I think in some point you mentioned, okay, there are some conditions when this uh, breaks. Uh, I was wondering if you could repeat that a bit. Yeah, so I mentioned in this case, this example, which is a very two photon microscopy uh, is a kind of a complicated thing. It basically, it takes two light, uh, light uh, particles or photons and then combines them together. And so in this case, it, it starts getting a little bit wonky but we don't typically encounter situations like this one in practice. Now, there are other situations in which things can also kind of break down. So for example, if you're using lasers, um, lasers uh, involve basically coherent light, 
and if you're not familiar with that, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But um, these coherent light waves can produce interference. They, uh, when you take a laser and you shine it onto a surface, uh, you can get constructive and destructive interference. And as a result, what can happen is if I have two light sources that I turn on at the same time, they actually can destructively interfere with one another. Turning on two light sources at the same time can actually reduce the light uh, when compared to just illuminating the scene with one light or the other. So this seemingly seems like it's a scenario where things break down. But in fact, there are linear models to describe these situations as well. Um, so we don't talk about transport matrices uh, in the context of transferring intensity in that case. Uh, rather, there's another matrix that's known as a transmission matrix that describes the properties of the waves of light that we're sending out into a scene. So there are scenarios like that one where things get a little bit more muddy, a little bit more complicated. But it's still possible to come up with models for light. Uh, we have ways to describe how light interacts with scenes. Um, and uh, we can therefore extend a lot of the ideas that are discussed here to these different domains as well. And uh, so uh, besides two photon microscopy, which is kind of a complicated, very, uh, uh, it's not something that we'll encounter every day. Um, there are scenarios like the interference of light where things can be a little bit more complicated, but we have the tools available to deal with that as well. Thanks. Um, um, following on, on that, I have uh, like another question that is more like, okay, uh, it's more like in this question about uh, going in the wild, uh, because I was wondering like, okay, so you need to control the lights. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, what do you think about this? Like, what are the challenges to go in the wild? Because I don't know, yeah. Give for example, about the noisy. So if you have some so noise in these uh, measurements uh, and so on. Uh. Yeah, so one big issue with uh, what we call sometimes active systems, like this, where you actively send out light patterns into an environment, um, is that, well, you have a certain light budget to work with. So if I want to, for example, do these types of imaging tasks uh, on an object that's maybe if far away from my, my imaging system, well, I might not have that much light that goes to reach that object and comes back in response. And so as a result, things might look very noisy. Um, so for example, when we're using you know, 3D scanners, you're usually trying to work on objects that are relatively close. If we want to image something that's far away, then it becomes a lot harder. And that's one of the, one of the challenges associated with this is that we only have a certain amount of light that we can potentially work with in these cases. And so that will determine what type of applications you can actually tackle with some of these things. Another one is actually getting programmable sources into consumer devices. So uh, our cell phones nowadays actually have dot projectors that can send out fixed dot patterns out into the scene, which is the example that I was showing uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, this guy over here. So these dot projectors can basically flash illumination of the scene. And we can use this as a way to capture some information about our scene. But they're not very configurable. So these dot patterns are actually fixed. Uh, they don't actually change. They're not programmable in the same way that a projector is programmable. Um, but you can do some basic things with it. So for example, you can still start thinking about how to actually extract shape from images like this one, where you're able to flash this illumination on and off very quickly. So the biggest challenges are getting programmability into devices and being able to do these things at long distances uh, and under ambient sunlight, which is a source of noise for this. So often we're in all the examples I was showing here, I was ignoring the, the contribution of ambient sources like the sun, which typically will interfere with these imaging tasks. Uh, there are ways to mitigate that effect. We can reduce the effect of sunlight uh, by filtering out the light in different ways. Um, but these are a couple of the challenges that we face when trying to do light transport analysis. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of works that basically combine a couple of different properties. So for example, when it comes to uh, uh, polarization, as one example, um, you might be, uh, you can use it in combination with time of flight to get better 3D shape. Uh, so uh, there's some work by Achuta Kandabi, uh, who's at UCLA, who used a Microsoft, Microsoft Connect um, combined with uh, polarization cues to start to get 3D shape that, that goes beyond the capabilities of the se uh, 3D sensing device. Uh, so it's using time of flight information to recover 3D shape and then refining that 3D shape using polarization. That's one example. Um, uh, sometimes this information is somewhat orthogonal. So for example, maybe color is not as useful in that particular case. Um, but uh, there are scenarios like the one I was just describing, uh, time of flight, polarization, that can give you some uh, certain advantages. Uh, another one is uh, trying to combine structured lighting with time of flight, which can potentially provide some benefits. So for example, uh, in the past, I'd use that to try to recover images in the presence of global illumination, to try to get rid of the, the contribution of light that's bouncing around the scenes and in complex ways, we can use structured lighting to remove that component and just capture uh, the component of light that travels straight into the scene and comes back directly, which will provide us with more accurate depth information. It's challenging though, right? So it's usually uh, you need pretty sophisticated sensors to do any one of these things and much more complicated system if you want to do all these things at the same time. Uh, so it depends on the task and exactly what you're trying to prioritize. Um, so often these things can get very expensive, for example. Uh, so uh, if you want to have a time flight detector, uh, you might only you might uh, have only a certain number of pixels to work with. And if you're devoting half of them to capturing polarization, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, you lose half your resolution. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, but uh, there's certainly advantages to combining these different cues together. Yeah, exactly. It's that's the biggest issue is that if you have lots of time and money and space, you can build these things in an uh, optical lab uh, and uh, do all the measurements that you would like. Um, but uh, trying to get this to work on consumer devices that will fit in your pocket, uh, that's always a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but uh, uh, it's something that we're striving to to get to, hopefully. That's my hope, at least, that we'll, we'll have all these different types of techniques in, the, in our pocket, and we can pull it out any time to capture all this, this interesting like, transport stuff. But that's a long ways away, I would imagine. No problem. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great, uh, a lot of fun. And I uh, hope uh, you all enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, there's resources on my website as well if you ever are interested in learning a little bit more.
Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a nice holidays. Uh, you as well. Have a nice cigarette. <laughs> of course. You as well. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.